so I'm going to uh, I'll uh, I'll let our experts talk. Um, I would say if you want if you do have a question, I would I, I'd like to ask right away. I, I find panels are a little bit more fun when they're when they're interactive. So just put up your hand and uh, we'll we'll acknowledge you. Uh, but we're we're going to start from my left and we'll go down the line and uh, everyone will introduce themselves and talk a bit about what they what they do and we certainly do want to have time for for questions and answers during this session. So Katie, turn over to you. Wow, I didn't expect that one to go first. All right, this is me, right? Yeah. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very much delighted to be here with all of you. So I'm Dr. Katie Kamkor. I'm a clinical psychologist at uh, Center for Addiction and, Ma and Mental Health. I work within the Work Stress and Health Program. Another place, another name for our program is the Psychological Trauma Program. And we deal primarily with occupational disability, occupational trauma, and uh, post-traumatic stress disorders. Um, I do specialize in the area of uh, depression and anxiety disorders and workplace-related matters. Um, I had the chance for several years to be part of the Hockey Talks, which is an amazing initiative to, uh, to really promote uh, mental health and have a better understanding of mental illness within the uh, sport, the sport world, especially um, within hockey. Um, also, uh, within my own uh, personal life, uh, my brother was a national table tennis player. So for many years, so every time Canada would win, my brother would win. Uh, he almost made it to the Olympics, but um, his other best friend was uh, getting his uh, PhD in electrical engineering. So essentially full-time um, uh, playing table tennis and then full-time for the PhD. So the PhD won over, So, uh, but he's still playing, uh, he's still playing. So I'm again very much delighted uh, to be here. What I would like to talk about um, today is really the stigma attached to the mental illness. We're doing a lot of great work, but we have further uh, improvement that is need, that, that needs to be done, especially within the world of sport. I would like to have a chance also to talk about some of the key stressors that athletes go through and of course about some of the coping strategies and, uh, and resiliency. Thank you. I guess I do not have a brother who's an amazing athlete. <laughs> uh, I, my name is Dr. Madeline Marcus and I'm also a clinical psychologist. I'm a quiet talker at the best of times. If you can't hear me, please wave at any point when I'm talking. Uh, I work in the Young Adult Eating Disorder Program at South Lake Regional Health Centre in Newmarket, Ontario, which is just north of here. And I also work in a private practice a few days a week uh, called Broadview Psychology in Toronto. I'm quite interested in the area of eating disorders in athletes, um, and that's what I'd like to speak today about. Um, before we kind of launch in and we have our discussion today, I thought it might be helpful to spend a brief moment identifying various different eating disorders so that when we say eating disorders, we're all kind of aware of what we're discussing. So according to the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, the DSM-5, there are four key, that was that I'll talk about now, eating disorders. Anorexia nervosa, which many of you might be familiar with, which is where someone res significantly restricts the food consumption, which leads to a significantly low weight, um, and associated significant fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, um, and really influencing how they feel about themselves in relation to their body shape or weight. Uh, and then we have bulimia nervosa, uh, which similarly someone would have an undue influence of their body in relation to their sense of self and self-esteem. Uh, for people who binge eat, which is consuming a large amount of food within a really short period of time, um, and have associated compensatory behaviors like um, purging through self-induced vomiting. Um, you also have binge eating disorder, which is where people binge and eat a large amount of food in a short period of time, um, and something called other specified feeding and eating disorder. I know that's a lot of jumbled words, but I just thought it was helpful to kind of orient us a little bit today, um, and feel free to ask any other questions. And how this kind of links into athletes is we do see significantly more eating disorders in athletes, especially in elite athletes. Um, and we know that the rates of treatment access and help seeking for people with eating disorders, especially in athletes, is quite low. And so it's important for us to have discussions like today to start decreasing the stigma, to address um, maybe some of the different uh, warning signs might be, how coaches or family members or athletes themselves can identify and look towards uh, seeking treatment. Um, so hopefully we'll continue that discussion as we move forward. Thank you. My name is Mark Allen. It's okay. Uh, from... My name is, there we go. My name is Mark Allen. 
I'm the Ontario director for an organization called the Respect Group. Um, but I spent close to 35 years as a police officer here in Ontario, and I wound up my career as the commander of the crime prevention section for the OPP. So under, in my past life, I dealt a lot with mental health um, in a number of areas, but one of them was about trying to uh, sort of bridge the gap between uh, police and, and those suffering from mental health in the community. And I also did a lot of work around the issue of child abuse investigations and prevention. So. Um, a few years ago, I crossed paths with a gentleman by the name of Sheldon Kennedy, who many of you will know, uh, when we were testifying before a Senate committee in Ottawa on a piece of child protection legislation. Sheldon Kennedy, for you, those of you who don't know, was an NHL player who had been sexually abused by his junior hockey coach, Graham James, and uh, uh, really suffered to the extent that he almost committed suicide as a result of that. Uh, when he finally uh, came out with his abuse, he decided he wanted to make a change and educate coaches around issues of uh, abuse prevention, bullying, and harassment. So we started an organization called the Respect Group. And to date, we've trained over three quarters of a million Canadians online in the issues of bullying, abuse, harassment, and discrimination. Uh, we have four programs, Respect and Sport for Coaches, Respect and Sport for Parents, Respect in the Workplace, and Respect in School. Over half of those that have trained are coaches and, act and youth activity leaders in Canada that receive this training. Um, so as, there, as things are constantly changing, uh, we constantly revamp this program. We just spent the last year rebuilding the Respect and Sport program from the ground up, and one of the key focuses was on bringing more mental health information and tools into it for coaches and youth activity leaders. And just as an example, um, we have expert clips within the training, and we brought two gentlemen in to talk about their experiences. One of them was a gentleman by the name of Glenn Canning. His daughter is Retea Parsons, the young a Nova Scotia girl that committed suicide about three years ago after being sexually bullied, sexually assaulted. It was all videotaped and posted online. And another gentleman is a gentleman by the name of Alan Hubley, who's an Ottawa City Councillor. And his son, Jamie, is, was gay, and he also committed suicide as a result of, of bullying. So we've really tried to um, give, bring good tools to coaches that are dealing with kids to help them understand, recognize the signs, that they may be experiencing with, with kids that are they're interacting with, understanding, helping them to understand that they may be the only trusted adult in this child's life, and they need to be aware uh, of what they're seeing, and they need to understand both their moral and their um, legal duty to report things when things come to them. Um, just in, you know, in reference to eating disorders, we're also rewriting the parent program right now, and one of the National Sport Organizations that's using our program is Synchro Canada, and they identified to us eating disorders with swimmers. So we've actually put a vignette in the, in the new parent program, which deals with the fact that um, a young athlete is under pressure from a coach not to eat leading up to an event, and you know the critical uh, importance of parents stepping in if they're aware of these types of things. All right, awesome. So, well, I uh, sorry. I tend to speak fairly loud and project my voice. I apologize for that. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Darnell Gerard. I don't uh, exactly have the academic or professional expertise of some of the others on our panel here today, but uh, I think my my expertise kind of comes from my own personal experiences and uh, and where I've been, uh, where I come from. So, I just graduated from the University of Toronto. I was a dual sport athlete there. Uh, my academic focus was uh, in human biology. I also dealt with nutrition and neuroscience as well. Uh, I played both uh, football and track and field on and off while I was there. And uh, I say on and off because uh, I had my own mental health struggles and uh, at times that had me uh, take steps back from sport. And uh, so I can kind of bring uh, that experience and uh, I guess some real world uh, I don't want to say advice, because I don't know that I have advice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my experience to this, and hopefully we can uh, chat a little bit about that. Um, during my time at the University of Toronto, I worked with a, uh, a charitable organization called the Student Athlete Mental Health Initiative, uh, or SAMI for short. And uh, they're basically just looking at the unique um, challenges that athletes face. We know that everyone uh, faces different uh, struggles with their mental health at times. Obviously mental health is a spectrum, right? You're never either healthy or uh, completely sick. You range from day to day, from month to month, from year to year. Uh, we're all in different uh, areas at different times. But uh, Sammy just understands that student athletes in particular have uh, unique challenges that they face. And uh, so we were about to push that out to the public and uh, saying what coaches, what the community, what friends can do and what you can do for self-care for yourself as well. And I uh, now after I've graduated, work for uh, a charitable organization called Jack.org. I don't know if anyone here is 
uh, heard of that. So um, what we do is almost the same approach. We're very, very much youth focused, um, and we basically empower a network of uh, youth all around the country through a bunch of different programming. So we have chapters at many high schools and universities uh, here in Canada. We also uh, go out and give, we call them Jack Talks. So I'm a Jack Talk speaker as well, which is maybe part of the reason I reject my voice uh, so much. But um, we go out and it's basically mental health advocacy. So we are trying to empower these youth to go out into their respective communities. We know that they know the challenges that are facing their specific communities and that there is no uh, one solution. So we want them to go out and advocate and be passionate about starting a conversation about mental health. And that's exactly why I'm here today because I love having these chats. So. Check. Uh, I'm Jacob Morris. <laughs> uh, uh, so with my story with mental health, I'm someone who lives with depression and anxiety. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was in one of the probably worst, worst spots of my life. Um, how it ties into sport, one of the coping strategies that I found works best for me is physical activity. And what I do uh, for that is run. So over the span of about a year and a half, I went from a place where Getting out of bed in the morning was a challenge, and, and you know, stepping up and going out my front door was a place. It was was a huge accomplishment. Um, to you know, a place where I was running around the block and running a 5K, pushing it up a little bit, and then finally got to a place around last September when I ran my first half marathon, and. It was that kind of euphoric moment. I had gone out, it was an evening about sunset, and I just got out to, to run a five, five kilometer run, which you know for me it can take me about 25 minutes. It's just gonna be a quick run. And running is kind of my meditation, the thing that I use to kind of be comfortable with my thoughts, give myself a place where I can think through uh, what I'm going through. Uh, you know, with severe anxiety, it can be really difficult sometimes to hold on to a thought and, and you know just go about your day but running has been something that is not only a natural mood booster for me and is obviously releasing a lot of endorphins and whatnot but is, is something that can give me a challenge that is very achievable in front of me and it was around this so last October where I said you know in my career I'm a freelance video producer uh, work mainly in digital video online but I wanted to say why not take my voice and my skills as a video producer and do something to spread not only my story, but then also connect with stories of, of other Canadians. So we just finished and we did, in one month, I ran 10 half marathons across the country. Um, we actually did it in 23 days. Um, and we shot, we shot a documentary about it. We were sharing our journey on social media the whole way connecting with Canadians across the country to, to talk about mental health, and we're also uh, in support of CAMH, a great organization, obviously. Um, and our whole mantra about the, the campaign, which is called Run to Wellness, is about turning something that can be immobilizing to someone's life into something that's inspirational. I think what I'd like to talk about here on this panel today is, yes, there is a stigma around it, but I also think that sometimes when people are talking about mental health, and specifically anxiety and depression, there are people where some of the narrative can be fairly victimizing, it can be fairly, fairly othering, where you're talking, maybe not even necessarily um, uh, down to someone, but, but it can kind of other them, where there's these people who are suffering from mental health, and there are these people who are not suffering from mental health. Whereas, the way I see it, we are all human beings, and we are people who, whether we're going through a severe bout of depression, or our neighbor is, or maybe someone we're just passing on the street, we can have that empathy and reach out to people and say, how are you doing? It's gonna be okay. And that's kind of what we're doing with Run to Wellness. We wanted to show that we can take on a huge physical challenge, running 10 half marathons in 23 days across the country, and do it because I'm someone who uses my own depression and anxiety to fuel me and to do something that's pretty amazing. You make me want to go and run. Yeah. And you did that injury free? Yeah, you did. That's impressive. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Sarah Galsworthy and I come from a different perspective as well. Uh, I work at, in the day I work at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in the Injury Prevention Office. I'm a program coordinator there. And one of the programs we run is called PARTY. Uh, it stands for Prevent Alcohol and Risk Related Trauma in Youth. And uh, we really focus on that R word, which is risk-related, and uh, much of what we talk about is um, 
prevention of sui su suicide and awareness, suicide and self-harm, as many of our young people are facing this. And uh, we're actually currently working on a research study where we're, at, we're surveying our young people, so grades 11s and 12s, and we do this in five different countries, we're trying to figure out what their perception of risk are. I know what the statistics say, but we would like to know what theirs is. And uh, out of a regular class of anywhere average, average number from about 30 to 50, we're getting one in three students disclose that they would consider self-harm or suicide, that it is an option for them. So I know that programs like mine, um, well, the, the data isn't, isn't um, we don't have it all inputted yet, but I can tell you what we're seeing is uh, about one in three, uh, and that's consistent in the other countries that we're working with, and so we need to, obviously all of us need to do a little bit of a better job in that regard. So that's my day job. I also work, uh, I'm a master trainer with Parks Rec Ontario with a program called High Five, which is a Canada's only quality assurance program, and we train young adults to create um, draw awareness to when we have school-aged children, creating environments where young people can thrive, both physically and emotionally safe, and understanding that things like meeting friends and sharing and, and social interaction, interactions need to be fostered and uh, mentored um, and done with intent at a really young age. Uh, we, we're trying to build better resiliency in our young people. Um, the, the conversation we use is we all have mental health and we all have to take care of it. Um, is, is the kind of is the language that we use, um, and we, we we teach a course that's called strengthening children's mental health, and it's about drawing creating some awareness and making sure that our young staff, so we're talking like summer camp staff, after school after school programs, sport programs, are going into the communities and not not diagnosing our kids, but being aware that each child has a different story, and we need to accommodate and nurture that story and make sure we have the avenues of support if needed. Um, and I also do a little bit of work with Canada Sport for Life, so that's the sport connection. We work with physical literacy. And what we're trying to do is get our young people more active. We believe that if children are making more developmentally appropriate risks at younger ages through their natural physical and mental development, that then when they're faced with real world problems, um, that they're going to be more, uh, more resilient and more adapt to do that. And, uh, and, I, and I, I can see, you know, going, traveling across the country, especially in this province, uh, and teaching and talking to coaches and recreation staff, uh, I, think, I think the conversation is going in a really great direction. Um, and I think probably the most important job is I'm a mom to a four-year-old who is starting to show some signs of some anxious behavior. If she's not in her Spider-Man suit, and this is like for reals, if you follow me on Facebook, nobody knows what my daughter's face looks like because she's 95% of the time in a Spider-Man outfit. She's like embodying him. But uh, you know, learning about how to nurture this young person and, uh, and give her the tools and, uh, and, and, and really educate our family on how to bring her up so she can be an awesome human and keep the world safe because she's super Spider-Man. So that's, that's some of the work that I do and uh, most of the work is with our sort of school-aged and teenagers uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the province and a few other countries. And you're making me want to run. I'm going to go for a run today. I am. That's I good. really am. Yeah, you inspired me. I used to run a lot. And now I don't. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Uh, before we move along, I just want to ask uh, the cameras to move quickly. How many people do we have in here that are athletes? As athletes? Yeah, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> we weekend warriors. Uh, coaches. In the room. And uh, parents, parents, grandparents. Uh, okay, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to I want to go through the panel again. I want to ask them about the, the warning signs with mental illness and, and how to help you identify. But I think I want to start with Darnell and Jacob and their experiences. And, and um, you know, did they see the warning signs, or, or was it somebody? Was there kind of a, a guardian angel that came along and, and made you understand what, that you were dealing with something beyond you know, having a bad day, a bad day at school or, or a bad game or a bad day at the office? So, Darren, I'll start with you. Test, test, I'll test this time. Um, so, uh, for me, when I personally started to kind of uh, have my, my struggles, we'll call them, when I uh, started to get a little low, uh, my I got, we call them almost like, you know, more depressive episodes here. When this started to happen to me, 
I don't know that the, the signs were readily apparent to people because I don't know that people were educated on, on what to look for. And for me to, um, I guess it started when I realized that this was something that needed to be uh, taken care of to be, um, I, need, I may have needed to reach out to somebody. We, I was a part of a varsity board, so I was uh, the chairman of our varsity board at the University of Toronto, so that was all the student athlete leaders, I suppose. Um, and we had our embedded varsity board counselor come in, so what a lot of students didn't know, myself included, is that uh, every week we had a uh, counselor available to us for uh, mental health services that we could go and talk with about what we were experiencing. And she came in and talked at one of our meetings and just kind of well, went over a few, I guess, um, sides that, that someone was struggling and I kind of took a step back just internally and I was like, well, like, this, this is how I feel. Like, I'm, I'm stressed to the point where I don't know how to cope with it myself. Self-help at this point is, I'm, I'm still struggling. I may need to actually reach out to somebody. So, um, I didn't uh, go to our counselor, but I started uh, talking to a few friends and just, I am an open person at, at, to a certain extent. Obviously, we all are. But um, I was finally at a point where I knew that I needed to reach out, but I know there's a lot of people who aren't there and um, who don't know how to, and that's obviously because there's a stigma associated with this stuff, and hopefully we're able to address that today. But I was able to reach out when I realized that, uh, that I needed to, but um, yeah, I know, I know a lot of people are. That's kind of where I'm at personally. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of warning signs and everything, there are definitely warning signs there if you are waking up like I was, kind of every night in a panic attack, or not not being able to go to sleep because you're hyperventilating. But I think in terms of in terms of knowing something was wrong, of course, I definitely knew something was wrong. But I'm also someone who loves to walk into a party or a room like this and have a big smile on my face and get to know everyone and and. and put up a facade that I am okay. So I think for a long time, even though I did know that something was wrong, I really didn't want there to be something wrong. So I pretended that there wasn't. Um, but but I, and I think that's that's part of the problem is that even though, you know, every, like you said, everyone's kind of a different level of openness and someone might be very comfortable talking to a close family member or maybe a friend, a counselor, or someone, someone who is, you know, there to mentor them that, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going on with me, I'm not sure who to reach out to, but then there are people like me who is, you know, several members of, of my family and, and close friends have, you know, all gone to therapists and they've, you know, people, lots of people I know have been on different medications or they have different coping strategies to deal with their own mental health, but for me, I think, especially in the industry that I work in where the harder you work and the longer you work, the, the you know, it's kind of a badge of honor to be really stressed out and be the one who's working the hardest. But so you don't want to open up and say, hey, I'm struggling, I need to take a back seat, I need to be working on things that I'm passionate about, putting my both physical and mental health first and foremost. So I, I, I got to a point where, where I wanted to make that change, but it's definitely something that's very difficult to get, get past. Go back to Katie and work our way down the line again. Thank you. Yes, I think that recognizing the, uh, the warning signs is so important. So I would say, you know, in addition to everything we talked about, it's similar to what has been addressed, any change in behavior, any change in personality, if we just don't want to engage in our daily structure or routine, especially as a parent or as a coach, as a teacher, we see a child doesn't want to do the routine anymore, the structure, the personality is a bit different, it could be more aggressive, maybe more withdrawn, we don't want to do our homework anymore, um, or anything we used to enjoy doing. It could be games, it could be playing with our friends, reading our book or homework, we decide suddenly we don't want to do it anymore, or also any change in our overall functioning. It could be academic functioning, uh, social functioning, so I would really pay attention to all those, um, all those changes. And, um, and, you know, as we talked about, we really want to normalize um, the talking about mental health and ideally making it as easy as it is to talk about uh, physical health problems. It's just so easy for people to talk about, you know, I have arthritis, I have back pain, I have a migraine or cancer related things. And so we really want to finally normalize the talk about uh, mental illness. And this is very much true in terms of, you know, especially within athletes because we know that one in five individuals um, suffer from uh, mental illness. So that means very much 
every single person, each of us, whether directly or indirectly, are impacted by mental, uh, mental illness. And, um, and this is also true for athletes. Now, within athletes, because there's so much pressure and emphasis on being uh, physically and mentally fit and active and healthy, that they're even more likely to suffer uh, from uh, uh, any mental health-related uh, problems. We know that whenever they suffer from a physical injury, right away there is a healthcare professional to ensure fast and speedy recovery. And ideally, we really want to do the same thing for whenever uh, they suffer from mental health problems. The other thing is that being physically and mentally fit and active um, and struggling with a physical problem or struggling from a mental health problem should not be mutually exclusive, right? We can be physically, mentally healthy and active and, and, and so on and at the same time struggle physically or, or even mentally. And the other thing is seeking assistance is very much a sign of strength and, and courage and, uh, and resilience. I want to thank you for including that as the first question that you've asked because I think it's such an important um, discussion to have around the early warning signs because we know that earlier intervention across the like, I mean, I can speak from the eating disorder perspective, but from all mental health concerns, early identification and access to the appropriate treatment, be that bibliotherapy like a self-help book or access to a family doctor or access to a therapist, psychologist, whomever, we know that the early identification is helpful and it sometimes does take you know aware of what those warning signs are before someone can say okay I have this sort of weird feeling in my tummy I don't really know what it is oh maybe that's me feeling anxious right to be able to put words to what someone's experience is thank you I was just turned up <laughs> um, from an eating disorder perspective I would say that all the things that Kathy spoke about also apply to eating disorders early warning signs they are um, a mental health concern as well so you're going to see some people withdraw a little bit more you're going to see some people uh, disengage in things that they used to engage and gain pleasure from um, specifically from an eating disorder perspective there's a number of different uh, early warning signs that someone might see and from a sports perspective I think you are really going to see um, people like parents especially for younger athletes you're going to see um, people like coaches who spend so much time with the young athletes maybe noticing some of these signs. And it could be initially an overemphasis on weight or shape, little comments that are made. It could be similarly to food. Someone might start on a diet, that then goes to the next step, that then goes to the next step. Um, or someone, you know, oh, I was hanging out with, at Billy's house last night, didn't have dinner, that adds up, that adds up. And someone, you're realizing that you haven't had dinner with your 16-year-old um, daughter in a long time. And there could be really subtle things. Eating disorders can be quite sneaky, um, it's not the person, it's the eating disorder, and can be quite secretive. And so to start to be aware of that and to maybe address it in an open, non-judgmental fashion with um, the young person, be it as a parent or as a friend um, or as a coach, I think is really, really important. Um, there are some um, the eating disorder um, awareness programs out there booklets specifically for coaches, specifically for parents around those early warning signs. You can Google it, I can send it to you if you get in touch with me, but there are some resources out there that go through and list all the different physical symptoms. Um, one obvious one might be weight loss, for example, um, that might first indicate that someone has been consistently at this weight and then you've seen a decrease in that. Um, I could ramble about a lot of different physical symptoms. Um, but I think trust your gut as a parent and as a coach that if something is sort of shifting in a direction that feels, um, makes you uncomfortable um, and you're noticing some of those early signs to address it and to suggest that someone reach out to their family doctor is often a really good first spot and that treatment is out there and is available and is effective um, so that someone can have the optimal performance from a support perspective and not have all the short-term, long-term physical and mental complications that come along with eating disorders. It's going to be pretty hard to add to what our experts have said, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, keeping kids in sport, and we had a bit of a discussion uh, early on about before we started here. Um, you know, the, the idea is that kids, sport is fun and safe for kids, and that they'll be engaged in it for the rest of their life. It's a, obviously, we all know it's a very positive thing for for children and adults to be engaged in sport. But there's often, uh, kids are playing one sport 12 months of the year and they're not doing anything else because their parents are pushing them to get to the elite levels of being an athlete. 
Um, we know that for every uh, adolescent boy that leaves sport, five girls leave sport uh, for a variety of reasons. So we're doing some working around a work around how to train coaches uh, to coach girls differently. But these are all issues. I mean, keeping kids in sport for the right reasons is critical. And again, I go back to something I said in the intro about how critical coaches and youth leader, youth activity leaders are in the lives of kids. Um, my previous life in policing, I worked a lot around the prevention of school shootings and threat assessment. And we talked about behavioral norms and if somebody goes off, you know, their baseline behavior could be a warning sign. And that people who are close to these kids often ignore uh, blatant indicators that somebody's heading down a pathway to serious violence. Well, if kids are going off their behavioral norms around some of the things we talked about, and uh, they're losing interest in, in sport or their, uh, you know, eating disorders, all of these different things are critical. So this, this awareness piece and, and being able to talk about it like we are here today and having those wonderful people that are volunteering their time to coach kids and, and lead kids, it's really important that they have some tools and some information uh, because these kids, as, as I said before, we, we don't often know what their home life is and they may this coach or this uh, camp, you know, camp counselor may be the only trusted adult that this child feels that they can disclose to, or they may not disclose, but the hair goes up on the back of the youth leader or the coach's neck and says something isn't right. And they've got to have some tools to sort of recognize because it's, it's tough growing up for these kids these days. To have the type of leadership that can help these kids is, is really important. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in again super, super quickly. Um, just because I've noticed that we're addressing uh, a lot of signs and symptoms that uh, you can see in somebody else. And just as someone who has, um, has struggled myself, uh, I just want to make sure that to put this out there for the athletes and the audience, the coaches, and really just everyone in general, is that we, we look to ourselves as well and we, we try to see some of these signs and symptoms in ourselves. So um, if you start to notice feelings are uh, becoming intense and long lasting and they're starting to affect the, uh, the way that you go about your everyday life, um, it may be time to talk to somebody, right? So this is something I wish that I had known at the time when I was, uh, was starting to struggle. I eventually uh, withdrew from the football team. At a point, I went back eventually, but uh, my, my struggles had gotten so difficult that I couldn't cope with everything that was going on around, uh, around me. So a lot of the time, student athletes like myself, I, uh, I was football track and field. I had my degree and I also worked four jobs on the side. Uh, in Canada, we don't always provide, uh, provide all that much funding. So, and my story is not all that unique either. That's something that we need to understand. That a lot of student athletes, especially, there are many types of athletes, but student athletes go through a lot of uh, of rigors and stresses as well. So, um, being able to have the tools to kind of look at themselves, uh, like I wish I was able to. So, when things are starting to affect you on a, a long term basis, so like weeks to months, and these feelings aren't changing, and uh, things that you're doing, the, the your behaviors, the patterns, and the things that you love, when that's starting to change, you're not doing them the same way. It starts uh, with to look at ourselves as well. So don't just look at others. Make sure you critically assess yourself and make sure that you're okay. Take a step back and ask yourself that as well. It's a great skill to have. Um, you know, the interesting thing I find about working within the communities and the communities um, that we're engaging is that often sport is the answer. Sport and recreation, put them in the same category. Sport is the answer to, and this is often what I hear from parents, my kid is stressed out so I can put them in sport. And the interesting thing with my work with Canada Sport for Life is that we, our sport model has changed and uh, in the long-term athletic development plan is we're pushing our coaches to specialize our athletes later. Um, there's some sport specific schools that we have, but there's some in Markham in particular where athletes can get their academic um, requirements as well as thrive in their sport. And they don't specialize till at least 16, which you know, you know, is still a young age. Um, but so back to the parents. So the parents are saying, my kid's stressed out is, is usually the language that we're hearing, so we're going to get them in sport. And that's where this really interesting conversation ensues. Because um, a few years ago, Parks Rec Ontario did a survey of thousands of children in Ontario and asked them, why do you go, why do you register in sport? Why do you want to play sport? And any guesses what their number one and two reasons were? Any guesses? Fun and friends were their, their first reasons. And then kind of parents come later, right? My parents, right, the crazy parent. And then, uh, not that any of us are a crazy parent. Um, <laughs> And the number one reason why they're pulling out of sport is because it's too competitive. And, and uh, when we're having, what was the number one in four, one in five are struggling? One in five are struggling. Um, we're putting them in these high stress pressure cookers to perform. It, we're setting our children up for failure. And, uh, and it's this cycle that we're trying to get ourselves out of. In Sport for Life, we're encouraging this conversation, which is physical literacy, is building fundamental movement skills. 
You would never throw your child into their first year at school and give them a book and say, here, go read that book and figure out how to read it. No, we rewind the skill set and we teach them ABCs, we teach them words and paragraphs, and eventually they can write a book or write, write a, a, a Mother's Day or Father's Day card to their parents. Um, or do blogging and do videoing and all these really cool stuff, get your PhDs. Um, but you gotta learn how to do an ABC before you can get there. And what with sport, we just throw kids in, in Canada, we re re reward coaches who win, regardless of how they win. Throw the kid in, give him some soccer balls, or her some soccer balls, or give me a sport equipment. And we're not teaching them the fundamental movement skills, how to hop, skip, jump, zigzag, do all these, all these important things so they can do these advanced movements. It's incredibly vulnerable for them to move their bodies in an environment with other kids. So that's the work we're doing in trying to get our, our parents and our, our summer camp and our young coaches to just kind of slow down a little bit and pull back. Uh, we're doing work in Markham, which is the community where I live. And we're doing this, we're trying to change the language we use with sport um, and uh, getting kids to register. And the director of recreation is saying to us, there is no way when we use these, this inclusive language, like come learn how to move your body, come learn about the essence of sport, the movement within sport. There's no way our parents are gonna register their kids because they're, they're parents. They want their kids to learn skills, drills. They want to be competitive. They want their kids to come home and say, my team won that soccer or football or that race. And we know that sport is so much more than that. And if we look at a lot of our national athletes, they started playing outside, unsupervised, in these free, unstructured environments and got into sport a little bit later, started to specialize later. So, um, so that you know, the conversation's definitely sort of starting to continue and making sure that when those, those children are starting to get identified. And like I was telling you earlier, our staff, we wanna make sure they're not saying, oh, you didn't do your homework today? This, this, we got a problem with this kid. Because that's essentially what happens. They see one sign and everybody sort of reacts. It's about knowing your kids, understanding who they are, and getting them to the right places, not overreacting or underreacting. I think there's an important balance there. Thanks, Sarah. We have any, uh, any questions right now? Sure. Uh, so thank you so much. This is an amazing panel. Everyone is, so I, I'd love to ask every single one of you questions, but I do have two areas of interest, and then um, and it's for people at this end right now. So I'm curious about um, workplaces. So I, I write for MedCan. Um, and so we, were, we focused about work, mental health in the workplace. So um, perhaps you could just speak to how the discussion we're having today in the workplace. And then I'm also curious about police and what we're seeing in the media right now, the case in Ottawa um, where a man died, um, mental health training with police. I know that that's huge. Maybe you could give us some insight. Thank you. Uh, definitely, I think that right now uh, the topic of mental health in the workplace is very predominant and actually this is um, one of the key areas that I specialize in and I go to the ministries and organizations giving uh, this type of talk. We know that aside from home, the workplace is a primary location of the adult life and so our work uh, plays a tremendous role in our, uh, in our mental health, in our well-being. Uh, and quality of life. Um, and right now also increasingly, employers are becoming more aware of the importance of uh, mental health in the workplace and they're trying to kind of instill a lot of procedures and policies and, uh, um, and kind of exactly everything into place to help um, instill mental health in the workplace. We know that uh, 50, the healthcare cost um, annually in Canada is around $51 billion annually. 35% of it is associated with mental health disabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's because uh, uh, within our work, if we suffer from any mental health issues, it can affect our productivity. So productivity goes down, absenteeism increases. There's also an increase in, in presentism. This is when we are at work, but we are not able to achieve our full potential and short-term and long-term disability. So this is a very predominant um, um, predominant area. We have come a long way, so in terms of increasing awareness, there's definitely more room um, to, to be involved in. Did you have any more specific questions yeah, in terms um, maybe of mental like health at work? The Canadian Mental Health uh, Commission, they have you know, mental health first aid. Uh, we see that as a really great tool. Do you know of a lot of workplaces encouraging their managers or even uh, employees to get mental health first aid because then people will see their colleagues along the spectrum and then they'll actually know um, hey, you're showing signs of being yellow today, or you're showing signs of being orange today. 
Is that something that workplaces are picking up? Yes, I would say yes, definitely is that we need to do much more. I think the idea would be that if we see uh, someone struggling, then, you know, we want to show, you know, as we had talked about earlier, right, we want to show a listening and acceptance and showing sympathy and empathy and definitely guide the person to whatever resources. So I think this is very, this is a very important one, along with other resources that could help. So uh, flexible work conditions that could help. Um, and also there are some other key factors that contribute to mental health within the workplace. But in terms of uh, resources and guiding person to the appropriate resource, Yes, uh, but again, it's, it's an ongoing improvement. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I agree with you. It's very important. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just speak. Still on here? Was that? Okay. So speaking to the workplace, I'll just mention um, because we deal with we have a program called Respect in the Workplace, and a great deal of that focuses on mental health. And we work very closely with the Mental Health Commission of Canada sort of support support the efforts and uh, it's interesting that organizations that are using our, our program are very again as, as our programs adapt and evolve over the years as new things come to light mental health has become front and center with our workplace program the same as it has with the sport program um, in terms of the you know police interaction with those with mental health I know as much about what happened in Ottawa as you do from watching the news um, a great deal has taken place over the last number of years, and I was very much involved with it when I was still with the OPP in bringing crisis intervention training to police officers to de-escalate situations. I sat on the Attorney General's task force here in Ontario around trying to decriminalize mental health behavior. I remember one of the judges that sat on, on the round table uh, was trying to figure out why he had an individual in his court who had kissed a streetcar here in Toronto, but there was a gentleman who had kissed a streetcar who was in this judge's mental health court. Unfortunately, the system sometimes is such that the only way to get immediate services are is if the person is in custody. And it's very unfortunate that the system sometimes has to be manipulated that way to get immediate services or get an assessment ordered for an individual. Um, but, you know, I can tell like these situations, I mean, there's, there's individuals, an individual in Ottawa apparently died at the hands of police. Um, there are police officers being killed by people with mental health. So a lot of work is, is being done to really try and um, create awareness for police officers and, and provide new tools around de-escalation to try and avoid these situations because they're tragic for all involved. I mean, they really are. Uh, the, you know, five officers shot and killed in Dallas, three in Baton Rouge as a result of the violence in the, in the U.S. is just, it's a mess right now. And uh, so hopefully, you know, cooler heads will prevail and, and uh, you know, it sounds, sounds like it's come to a boiling point in the U.S. where it sounds, and I've heard some police leaders saying, like, enough's enough. And they, they are acknowledging that, that they need to do something about police training and to, to try and avoid these types of situations. Anybody else want to chime in on that? No? Uh, any other questions? Oh, sure, just hang on a second. I think Leon's going to bring the mic over to you. And obviously, high performance sport by its nature is a highly stressful environment. Do you feel that competition, like maybe top performing, can exacerbate mental health issues with athletes? And, and if anyone has anything. Do you want to start, Sarah, with that? Yeah, I was going to throw it down at that end, <laughs> but maybe we can sh share it a little bit. Um, I mean, my work is often with school-aged children, and so it's developmentally appropriate, and we know that some children thrive in that environment and some people do not, and it's really about understanding that, but I can assure you that just having it as, a, as putting, putting children in sport to cure mental health and make them more resilient is, is not the way we want to talk about sport, right? We want people to take care of themselves and be healthy but we want to make sure that we have that balance. So I can assure you that putting our young children, our school-aged children, in really competitive environments, if that child's not ready or is predisposed or is suffering, um, no, it, 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 we're, going to get, we're going to continue with these incredibly um, scary dropout rates that we're seeing, especially for our young girls. Especially for our young girls. But I think that uh, the penalty will. Maybe I'll add a little bit from an eating disorder perspective, and then we can also speak more generally. If you think about someone you know, especially for certain sports that are more weight uh, driven or shape driven, as a lot of, you know, a number of them are, if you're receiving negative 
feedback from Gorman's perspective. Um, I think that that can heighten, if I could only just lose five more pounds and get to a different um, shape, you know, if I could just get my body a certain way, you can see how if someone has the bi biological predisposition to developing an eating disorder, you add on that stress, you add on that pressure to be a certain ideal, um, especially if someone is not performing at the level that they are hoping to or expecting to or their coaches or family are putting that added pressure on. I think also it can be, get reinforced if someone um, is fitting into that ideal a little bit more as they are restricting their energy intake more. Um, that is going to reinforce that behavior and that someone, all of us, would feel more driven than to continue to try to meet that ideal um, because it's being reinforced and positively by people around us most likely. Um, and so I think from an eating disorder perspective certainly that can be the case. The other thing just to mention, we haven't mentioned the term perfectionism, um, but a lot of people who experience eating disorders, there's a lot of overlap in terms of perfectionism. And then in sports, uh, you would also see that as well. And so if someone is driven so strong um, from you know, just a personality trait in an area, in an industry that is also very perfectionism driven, uh, that that can sort of exacerbate um, the stressors um, from eating disorders perspective, but more generally. I wonder if you want to add a uh, couple. Thank you. I think that uh, generally speaking, there is a difference between um, you know, playing a leisure activity, meaningful activity, like a sport, like 20 minutes here, 30 minutes here versus, you know, we are entrenched into becoming an athlete and, and, and so on. Um, if we do struggle from a mental problem, obviously we want to build our protective factors. Sport can be one of them, but again, knowing the boundary, knowing the limit so that we can deal with the stresses, as you mentioned, it doesn't um, you know, complicate the matters, right? So it's essentially where we can create that limit. Now, in the world of sport and athletes, there are some key stressors. Not only they have to deal with daily life struggles, like all of us, and significant life events, but there are some inherent stressors that they go through. Obviously, the intense training and preparation, and a lot of anxiety. Anxiety over underperforming, anxiety over letting others down, anxiety over not achieving our goals and standards and expectations, obviously anxiety before competition, during the competition, and at times also guilt and rumination and anxiety after the competition. And also at times we have to sacrifice um, uh, other areas of our life, um, social events or events with families and so on because again of the heavy training and uh, preparation. And uh, um, needless to say, the physical injuries and pain. So there are a lot of inherent stressors uh, that very much athletes uh, athletes uh, go go through. Just as I hand the mic back, I just want to add one thing. I feel like we also um, should identify how important sport and physical activity can be for mental health, right? I think we've been talking a little bit on some of the complications that we see from a mental health perspective. There's a whole massive body of literature and research in the area of the importance of exercise in improving our mental health. Um, and I don't think that we want to erase all forms of sport. There's a huge amount of importance in that. And from an eating disorder perspective, my goal isn't to have someone stop, stop all activity. It's to return to activity as is appropriate for that person. Um, and I think that that's just a piece that you know, I want to add because I felt like we were addressing. Thank you. So, um, I just wanted to say that you know, in, in Canada today, we're seeing one in four of our children are at risk for inactivity and, and essentially obesity, and which causes extreme stress. Right. Whoa. Well, um, so one in four of our kids are inactive. So we, we, yeah, definitely. I'm so glad you said that because sport certainly can complicate things, but it also is a beautiful experience. I came from sport, um, and uh, we want to make sure that we do encourage kids. And, uh, and our, our role sometimes is educating parents on making sure they pick the right environments for their child and those right coaches. Um, not just a winning team. Is it an inclusive team? Is it a supportive team? Is it a safe team? Those sorts of things. Yeah, I guess just to piggyback off of that, I, I, I'm obviously talking about like some of my negative experiences uh, with sport and how that stressed me, but it is an absolutely incredible thing as well, right? There's a reason that so many people are, are involved with sport that we put our children in. Um, that's where like the environment does play a huge role, where coaches and parents can play an enormous role uh, for children, uh, for athletes all the way up, up in age. Um, having these safe, supportive environments, uh, so pre-competition, not just 
for coaches, not just asking your athlete how your legs feel and like, are you ready for this, but like, say, how do you feel? Like, getting a real feel for, for your athletes, like, on an individual basis and, and how they're feeling uh, can go a long way. So it's, um, it's the community that, that's around them that really, really does impact how the sport plays a role in their life. Yeah, totally. And, and just branching off of that, like, we've talked a lot about seeing the warning signs of mental health, but we, like, I think a lot of that has been focused on sort of what happens when someone is severely depressed, right? But mental health is something that you have to think about constantly. Everyone has a, a, a mind in here, and prevention is a huge thing as well, right? Like, someone can eat, pop a vitamin C and wash their hands so they don't get sick every day, but no one's thinking, what should I do to maintain my mental health on a daily basis? Um, and then back to the competition, like you said, I think competition can be healthy and, and there is something engaging about competition and being on a team where it's, it's, it is fun to win, but sometimes it can be fun to lose as well. And I think one of the main things with sport, and, the, and this can tie into the, maybe the way that coaching is happening as well, but one thing that's extremely important to remember is that failure is fine, right? Like going out and losing is okay. I recently ran uh, a couple of months ago the Sporting Life 10K here in Toronto, and I ran the fastest 10K that I've ever run, right? But about 900 people still crossed the finish line before me. Does that make me a failure? No, I still had a great day. I felt great about myself, and there was something that you could draw from that, right? Like, you don't have to say, oh, I'm in this running race, but I didn't come first, so I'm a loser, and I gotta feel bad about myself about that. It's about kind of, looking at sport from a different perspective and saying I'm enjoying participating in this physical activity and I'm going to continue to do it because it's making me feel good and even if I come last, even if I'm like the 20,000th person across the finish line, I still get a medal and a bagel at the end of it if I feel good. <laughs> I'm just going to say quickly, that, I mean, that's a key message. I think it's a message that needs to come from the coaches and parents. I mean, I, Anybody that's a golf fan and watched Phil Mickelson and Henrik Stenson two Sundays ago, I think that's one of the greatest four hours of sports I've ever watched. And at the end of the day, Phil Mickelson finished second and in essence lost, but you sure can't say he lost. I mean, the guy played his rear end off that day, he just happened to get outplayed by, by a better golfer on that day. Um, you know, I just, uh, I just uh, loved, you know, what you said and also especially how you said it and you made it in such a fun way and this is so so true right as to how we always need to recognize our positives and our strength and what have I learned about myself and we always want to focus on what do I have control over but especially of our positives and our strength so that we can move forward and then build our self-confidence and the other thing is that you know as very much you said we don't want to base our sense of self-worth based on the outcome regardless of the outcome we need to celebrate the hard work and the positives and strength and the positives and strength remain regardless of the outcome now whether this is sport or in, in anything that we do in our life especially performance situations but in anything that we do in our life we always have to be uh, mindful and to praise um, you know our positives and, and our contributions and our hard work again regardless um, regardless um, uh, of, uh, of the outcome. So thank you for bringing that up. Very true, very true. Um, I think we have about five minutes left. Okay, go ahead. This mic's right for something. Thank you, Raymond. Can you hear? Perfect, thank you. Um, speaking as an elite level, or former elite level athlete, I spent 20 years as a competitive triathlete and can comment on the weight situation. As an athlete, yeah, we do lose weight for performance. And it's interesting because you're, there's that emotional contagiency, you're around teammates that are doing the same thing, but you also see performance results, getting, you're getting faster, you're getting faster, you're getting faster, and there's a big divide between elite level athletes and recreational athletes, and I think that's something we really have to distinguish between, because that recreational athlete, there's a lot of benefit there from a health and wellness standpoint. When we look at the elite level, um, yeah, there's a lot of mental challenges as an athlete I went through. I remember when I stopped competing, I put on weight, 10, 15 pounds, it doesn't sound like much, but I felt so much healthier. The flip side is though, when I'm qualifying for world championships, it's seconds that gets me you know, a spot at the world level. And then it starts over again because the level of competition is just going up. And you know, a great example of you know, health and wellness and mental health in sport gone awry um, 
just look at the former, quote, seven-time winner of the Tour de France. That's all encapsulated in that story there. It's a great example. But that, that weight and performance, it's, at that level, it's, it's always going to be, yeah. I think you're life. highlighting so many important things um, from both a weight perspective, not even an eating disorder. I mean, I see where we can talk from a continuum perspective, right? We talk eating disorders on one end of this spectrum, um, and there's many different ranges of relationship with body, weight, food, etc. And you're so right about the distinction between an elite athlete um, versus someone who goes for a 5K run on a Thursday evening, right? There's quite a big difference in terms of that. And regardless, though, someone who might be, you're going to be really reinforced for keeping at that, I think we were talking before about that, I can't remember what the term they used, but the competition weight. Uh, you're going to be reinforced for having that competition weight because you're getting that seconds more. And sometimes you, people do need to keep at that weight and that's reinforcing and it does lead to improved performance. There's something called the um, uh, athlete triad, I'm probably um, misremembering the exact definition, where sometimes people who are elite athletes will have, for females for example, will, um, they will have amenorrhea so they'll lose their period, right? That is sometimes quite common in people who are elite athletes and have really low body weight. It can still lead to a lot of long-term health complications, even if they don't necessarily have an eating disorder, right? That might lead to um, difficulties in terms of what you probably heard. It's just that, that's very yeah. common. It, it, yeah. Usually if a female athlete's not there, she's probably not at her ideal racing state, yeah. believe it or not. And it is really complicated. It's something that I work sometimes with some of my clients around. Um, if someone has a very entrenched eating disorder, and it has been reinforced and they have gone to that where they are restricting so much so that their energy input is significantly lower than their energy output, especially if they're an elite athlete, there's lots of energy output, um, that there's health complications that people might need to take breaks from, if there's concerns with their heart, for example, they might need to take breaks from that sport and that I'm sure for someone who's been working that hard at that level has got to be very, very difficult to acknowledge and to take that time out from the training. But you raise many different, a um, variety of different important pieces. Thanks. Okay, um, I kind of feel like, yeah, that's, that's two o'clock, but let's take one more question. Is somebody there? Somebody we'll take two more questions. <laughs> All right, um, my question kind of lies within like eating disorders, but I wanted to know, because um, currently there is a lot of like different eating patterns that kind of are like in the nutrition world, um, specifically within fasting and intermittent fasting. Uh, what would be, in terms of like warning signs, what would be specific warning signs in terms of eating disorders and if someone might be fasting excessively? First off, not a dietitian or nutritionist. So I think that, that there's you know lots of amazing uh, dietitians out there who can answer uh, probably in a more articulate fashion than I can, but I'll do my best. There are so many fad diets out there. There's so many, I'll remove the word fad. There's so many diets out there, right? That people hear um, fasting, paleo, et cetera, et cetera. And we hear it in the media all the time and we sometimes are conveyed that this is a healthy, um, approach to getting the body that we want or the weight that we want. Um, I read a study recently where they, they looked across the board at a lot of the different fad diets that have come in and out over the years and really at the end of the day demonstrated that a lot of them, they might be effective in the short term for immediate weight loss. They might have longer term potential complications health-wise uh, and they don't necessarily learn to lean to longevity in terms of that weight loss. And so basically the message is diets don't work in the way that I think uh, our broader society sort of hopes or wants them to. Um, and so from a fasting perspective, I always get sort of, my gut get kind of anxious about it from an eating disorder perspective that I sometimes I have had people who've started to fast and it might have kick-started um, more disorder type eating. But again, it's a continuum, right? So it's not to say that someone who's fasting has an eating disorder. It could be an indication of someone who had struggles from a body image perspective and a want to decrease their weight. And it might be a warning sign, but it's not necessarily to say that it is because there are so many different 
um, diets out there that people do. I'm mindful of time. Okay, we'll take one more question. Hopefully, our panel can stick around for a few minutes afterwards in case there are questions. So we'll take oh, a question yeah. right here. I'd just like these two gentlemen, congratulations for your recovery from whatever problem you have. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, congratulations for two of you. I just want to know were you ever under the care of the physician that who would like to prescribe you antidepressants and stuff like that? Were you ever on that? I can say that. Oh, sorry, I can say that I, I personally never took any antidepressants or anything like that, so I was never on any any, any medication at all. Okay. So you were recovered on your own, in a way. Yeah, support. Yes. Myself as well. I've never taken any medication right. for it. But one thing that I do say, you know, when talking about mental health, yeah. running for some is something that really benefit that benefited me. But there's really no one solution that fits all, right? Like it might be a combination of medication and therapy and then physical activity or. or any one of those individually, right? So it's just kind of being open about you getting help and, and finding what works for you. Yeah. So you never receive any medical uh, treatment or anything like that? Right? Yeah, no, I don't think either of us are. I think it really was just um, understanding that there was an issue, uh, seeking help, and then having a supportive community around us. That was, was I think, what uh, helped the two of us. And I can't really speak for you, but I believe that's what helped us, yeah. Because a lot of people having problems like that, they just ask the doctor to prescribe something, you know. I read an article, so many people, I don't know, millions, walk in the street, they are antidepressant. <laughs> Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, Steve McAllister, you did a great job moderating. That's a large panel. And thank you to all of our panelists. I just want to say a couple of quick words. Uh, really, first off, thanks to TELUS. This is a beautiful venue, and we're really grateful that they allow us to use this. Thank you to you for coming. We have, the Lunch and Learns are regular in a series for us. We don't have another one coming up to announce. We tend to have one in September tied into the film festival. So uh, stay tuned to our website, uh, maybe uh, subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get word of that if we have it. Our next event is a full day conference in this venue all on recovery. It is called Bright Future. Uh, check on our website to look at for that. It should be really good. Lots of great speakers. The keynote speaker is uh, Tammy Sutherland. She's the one of the morning hosts of Breakfast Television. We'll have a few opening remarks by uh, Sophie Trudeau, the Prime Minister's wife. And uh, lots of panels throughout the day. So please sign up for that and come. We'd love to see you there. And then our Silver Dinner, which is our annual fundraiser, is on November 2nd. That may seem like that's a far way away in the middle of a beautiful day like today. But it's coming up, and if that's of interest to you, uh, again, look to our website. I also want to give Chelsea Riccio, who's our communications manager, just one second to plug a couple of things herself. And uh, then class dismissed. So. <laughs> yeah, so speaking of sports, <laughs> um, the Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon is coming up on October 16th which seems really far away, but I'm telling you because we are actually one of the featured charities that you can run on behalf of. So basically you can register for, for the marathon, run the marathon, and also raise money for us, basically. Um, and it's not just a marathon, there's a half marathon and a 5K as well, as well as like a walk-in option. Um, so you may have seen these like beautiful cards at registration. Um, if you didn't pick one up, please do. There's the link on here to register, and like we also have some exclusive promo codes that you can use. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it obviously, they talked a lot about how running can be beneficial for your mental health for some people. <laughs> um, and it's also like, it's going to be a great kind of like team building community type of feel to it. And the fundraising aspect of it is really easy. Like we basically give you all the tools to do it. You get your own fundraising page and there's some like fun perks and stuff. Um, so yeah, pick up one of these and if you have any questions about it, um, please feel free to talk to me. But yeah. Thank you for coming.